Uh, you know, my goal is today is to not uh, make you all super educated about all of the high-end laminitis and uh, a lot of the lame cases that, that I work with every day, but to, uh, to give you some information about from working on those tough lameness cases, what, what can we do for cases early on? The, how, the horses that you manage every day uh, that are sound performance horses, but yet that might be the same horse that I see five to ten years later that has pathological problems because of those biomechanics that that, uh, that horse had to live with his whole life. So uh, keep that, that thought in mind as we go through this presentation. My, uh, we're going to be doing a horse here uh, after this, and we'll try to roll through this presentation here in about 30 minutes just to kind of get us all on the same page of evaluating mechanics. Terminology is a big part of it, just to make sure that we don't get lost in anatomy and terminology, and then also just to get you in the thought process of thinking biomechanics, and uh, that way, uh, no matter whether you're shoeing the sound horse or the uh, severely lame horse, these biomechanical principles are all there. So it's something that we all have to think about, whether we're shoeing the performance horse at two and three years of age, or the same principles I think about when I'm shoeing that same horse when it's eight or 10, and have a deep visual flexion tear. Uh, those same concepts are there, just that we're gonna take it to different levels based off of what that horse, uh, horse's lameness is and his, and his job at that point. So we think about mechanical concepts, and, and you know, I used to think, well, you know, why do I need to think about mechanics when I'm a shoe horse? You know, just get some steel on there, give it some protection, and move on to the next one. And, and, I, and I did that for several years, uh, you know, through veterinary school, shoeing horses, and you know, shoeing pack horses in, in Northern California. It, didn't, it doesn't take a whole lot. It's main, they may need some wear protection, but uh, as I became a veterinarian and started seeing lame horses, then I started to see that uh, I need to be a little more effective than, than just managing hoof castle and managing protection. So. We think about the mechanical concepts. There's, there's, just like with everything in everyday life, we have uh, structures that determine the loads based off of door hinges, seats, chairs. Horses are no different, so we can evaluate those mechanics based off of conformation, uh, deep digital flexor tendon tension, uh, levers, links of the coffin bone that will help us uh, design preventative shooting protocols. So again, we talked about the uh, preventative shoeing program based off of those is, is I think is probably where I think there's the, the greatest amount of opportunity for, for us as farriers early on in the horse's life to deter or at least delay some of the problems that we're seeing every day. Uh, de defining where a horse naturally loads that limb or that foot on an everyday basis for me is a, is, has become a big part of my lameness exam. If, if you can evaluate, start to evaluate confirmation, say, well, you know, every day for the, this horse's life, he has load up, loaded up that medial heel because that's the way that he's built. When I'm doing a lameness exam, that's gonna be one of the things that are highest up on my list. I'm gonna be thinking, hey, guess what? He's been beating up his medial heel since the day he hit the ground, so that's gonna be my first area to think about from the lameness exam. So all, all of these limb confirmation deviations and the mechanical setup will lead to a wear and tear over time that is helpful to, to think about. And I wish I would have learned more about a biomechanical exam in veterinary school trying to find lameness. Uh, again, we're, we're talking a lot about radiographs and how to uh, do diagnostic blocks, but they don't really talk a whole lot about, hey, when you look at this horse, because of his spinal intorsion and his low PA, he's gonna beat up that inside heel and possibly a cord crack. That's gotta be pretty high on the list. You know, the first thing we jump in and do is block the foot out. Uh, and, and granted, that's still helpful, but uh, being able to evaluate those limbs, I think, has been helpful for me to, to, to really dial in some of my, at least add information to my lameness exams. And I've alluded to this a lot already, but uh, a lot of conformational and mechanical scenarios within our horse limbs have very repetitive uh, lameness scenarios. So, again, uh, you see in the sound horse put his first pair of shoes on when he goes into training at two. You have a large responsibility and an opportunity to start manipulating that horse's mechanics throughout his training years so that we delay some of the onset of these lamenesses that I see when I'm when the horse is anywhere from five to eight. Uh, a way that we are going to uh, evaluate a lot of our mechanics of course is going to be very graphical and I, and I realize that uh, it's, it's very rare that you have clients that are going to be shooting radiographs on two-year-olds before they go into training. But I will suggest to you that it shouldn't be that uncommon in all reality because 
their structure is what it is for the most part at two years of age. And if you were to take baseline radiographs of that horse and start designing mechanical shoeing based off of if they've got a leverage, if they've got club feet, and start managing that appropriately, I think you'll have a much better horse uh, when that horse is in the prime of his career at eight to 10 years of age. So in an effort to do that, uh, try to get us all on the same page with communication. Uh, again, this will give us a tool to monitor your response. So let's say that if you're gonna make your shoeing goal, then you need to be able to come back, post shoeing, take a radiograph and say, yes, I've reached that goal. And secondarily, to see what happens to that horse as he grows five or six weeks, what happens to his, to his palm mark. Uh, what happens to all the mechanical things that we're able to measure. Uh, and talked about this a lot already, but identify those horses that have predisposing biomechanics that are going to lead to lameness. Uh, I see a large number of horses in my practice that have lower heel, longer toes that we've, we've heard a lot about. They all have the same MRI pattern. They all have deep measure flexor tendonitis, and Victor Bursides, cough and joint uh, problems. Because of that set of biomechanics that they've been dealing with for, for a long time, it eventually starts breaking the body down where it can't heal and recover from it. And then we have to be more aggressive at, our, at that point, once there's lameness there, to keep those guys sound. But if we determine that early on, uh, I think we can be a little more flexible. Again, it's, it's helpful too from a veterinary and farrier standpoint and amongst farriers to be able to communicate on the same token. So if you call me and say, hey, Doc, I've got a, uh, a low heel horse, how do I shoot it? You know, there's, there's a lot of information there that we need to gain. But if you call me and say, Doc, I've got a horse that's uh, PA is negative three, he's got a medial list, his bone angle is 32, his HL zone is 15 over 15. You start spewing all these numbers out, I can sit there and draw that radiograph or that foot on a piece of paper and I can really give you some detail. So it's a good way to communicate, number one, but also uh, be able to, to follow your progress once you start measuring all these. And we're going to go through these a little bit uh, uh, individually. So one of, the, one of the first things I'm looking at a lot of times, or uh, one of the main measurements is called the CE distance. And typically, uh, I used to only measure this basically from the top of that barium paste. Is that showing up for you guys? Perfect. So from the top of our barium paste down to the extensor process, the coronary band extensor process. So that gives you an idea about where that cough cone is inside the hoof castle. Now, I see, you see different people using this number in different ways. Uh, for me, it's not a number that, from a, from a laminata standpoint, you'll see people say, well, if it's anything greater than 10 millimeters, it's a sinker. And, and I, I find that uh, difficult to follow because I have sound horses that range anywhere from 10 to 40 millimeters and they're sound with no problems. So, I look at it from a serial standpoint, if I do have a laminitis case, I'm going to look at that measurement on the first day that I get to see it, and I'm going to follow that measurement out. If I have a measurement on day one that's 8 millimeters, 10, 10 days later I re-extra that horse and it's 15, that's a very significant change. However, that's the only way that I really interpret that. Uh, I don't put a set number on it that, that is in or out of the healthy zone. One of the things that I've started uh, looking at more because it, I get a lot of x-rays that don't have paste marking on it for consultations. So I had to figure out a way to uh, measure this relative distance of the extensor process to the hoof capsule. Uh, and if you look at the, the, the proximal coronary band where the coronary crest is and that coronary groove is, there'll be a point right there. And you can, on today's digital x-rays, we can all see that very well now. So, one of the measurements that I probably follow more now is I'll go from the point of that coronary crest there up to the extensor process, uh, and that does a couple things. Uh, it takes one of the opportunities for human error out. Uh, whoever put the paste on the hoof wall is one opportunity for human error. It's hard to put the paste on the exact same spot every time. So that takes that point of human error out of the picture when all I have to do is, now my only human error is picking the spot on the radiograph where I think that coronary crest is. So I think for me it's been a little bit more accurate and uh, obviously been uh, on, on looking at consultation radiographs that are, that are not marked with paste, it's been a helpful, helpful thing. And that, that range I've seen anywhere from, it stays pretty static in healthy horses, but usually it's right around five to eight millimeters. Horton Meller zone um, is, a, is another component. Again, we're just trying to spatially put this biomechanical process together by identifying where the cough bone is inside this hoof capsule. So this is the two components. We've got a horn zone and our lamellar zone. 
Typically on a healthy sound horse, you'll see this around 15 millimeters. A healthy shot horse. And I, would, and I would pour that in my notes as 15 over 15. Now you take a horse like this, it's been barefoot her whole life, you'll see that this is probably closer to 18 millimeters. And the majority of that, uh, the larger portion of that is gonna be the horn wall. So the, the, to further break this down, we'll, again, we have this juncture here called the dermo epidermal junction. And this is between your lamellar zone and your horn zone. The, the horn zone is made right here at the corner band and it grows distally. So once it's made, the only thing that changes it is what we do to our rasp. Uh, whether we're taking it back and foot up or uh, that's about the only thing that really changes it other than growth anomalies from laminitis or uh, tumors or trauma. Disease processes that occur in the horn zone, of course, is white line disease. Terms. So that's where you're going to see lucid zones and different problems is going to be in the, in the horn zone. The lamellar zone uh, is what I typically monitor really close and it stays most of the time around seven and a half millimeters across all the horses. From a laminitis standpoint, you can see that swell early on as much as three or four millimeters before there's any radiographic displacement. You'll see that lamellar zone start to change. Then if I'm dealing with cases that have structural failure of the lamina already, You'll see that the, uh, instead of measuring just the rotation, I'll actually measure the lamellar zone top and bottom. And then obviously if they've rotated, you're going to have a diverging or a wider bell zone at the bottom than you do at the top. And I'll record those numbers in an effort to, to uh, follow the case. So lift, uh, of course, is, is a really good health parameter monitor. Again, it, uh, I measure it from the tip of the coffin bone down to the, the cup or the, the, basically the bottom of the sole. And then I would also uh, measure the amount of cup that's present. So in this horse, let's say that's 18 millimeters of sole, he's got a three millimeter cup. So that uh, is something that we're all usually pretty aware of um, because it takes a certain amount to keep them sound. And horses that have a good set of biomechanics and don't need our help a whole lot, this horse specifically, I think I've trimmed it one time in nine years, and I think I leaned it to tell you the truth because it, didn't, it, didn't, it just didn't need a whole lot of help, and I think that uh, this was my girlfriend at the time, now wife, and I said, oh, I'm gonna really show off, I'm gonna get her to be nice to her and trim her horse. And the horse had never been trimmed, and it was nine years old, and uh, I thought it needed a trim, and, and uh, I probably took a little too much off, and she was sore afterwards, and it happens to all of us, I guess, but this horse manages itself biomechanically very well. It doesn't need a whole lot of help from us. He ain't lived in an environment that managed it well, and that's, that's a soul that he would have, or she would have all the time. That was, you know, that's, that's, that's a foot that I don't commonly see in my practice. Those, those horses are easy to manage, they don't have problems, you know, unless this horse had, you know, would have some sort of trauma or a tendon injury or something like that, or a laminitis, then I don't get to see that, or that many horses that come to me very first that have that much soul uh, Digital breakover is one well, I used to measure a lot more, and it's still important, again, when you think about digital breakover, uh, think about it as a lever, uh, it's, it's a lever arm versus, uh, to me, breakover is actually an action. The foot breaks over and moves forward, that's more of an action. Uh, but I learned this approach from Dr. Redden, uh, and he calls it digital breakover, so I kind of pass on that torch. But uh, think about it from a leverage standpoint. And most sound horses that are barefoot, like this horse that doesn't have any problems, that usually runs around 20 to 25 millimeters. And the average horse that doesn't need a whole lot of our hair. Something that in my practice I've started to pay attention to more because it's more relative to, uh, I think, physics and engineering type equations where we can actually measure the kinematics and some of the, uh, the leverages that are, that are present is I just simply call it a, tap, uh, a toe lever. And I have a static measurement and I have a dynamic. So a static measurement would be if I look from the center of rotation of the coffin joint. That's a static toe lever, that, that's the way that it is. It's not gonna change. There is that, that bone is what it is, unless there's a considerable amount of resorption or surgery to remove the tip of that coffin bone, that toe lever will be present that horse's whole life. That's a good number to measure because, again, it's static. It's not gonna change a whole lot. And then also, there's a wide variation of horses that, uh, within horses, on the same horse. You have one horse that will have a, sto a static toe lever that's, say, for example, five, uh, five centimeters, and the other foot will be six or seven. So it lets you know that right then that foot's got a lot more leverage than the other side. The dynamic toe lever is measured from the center of rotation 
to wherever the foot will leave the ground. The dynamic toe lever is what you and I can affect. Chewing, trimming, that's what we're gonna, we're gonna be able to affect. Uh, to affect. Again, we're, we're talking about leverages that are gonna be acting against the visual flexor tendon. Jumping ahead of myself a little bit, we'll be in the just a minute. Another important one that, I, that I'm following a lot to help define the biomechanics of that horse, the way that he was born essentially, is the bone angle. And I didn't realize for a long time that uh, there's a huge variation of the shape of coffin bones inside of feet. And they, I've got, I've got x-rays of horses and it ranges anywhere from 32 degrees to 60 degrees. But yet I think I learned early on uh, that I think we're trying to manage all of those feet the same. We're making decisions based off of toe angles a lot of times and not really considering the bone angle itself. And the reason that's important, at least in my practice, we're trying to make decisions about trying to make decisions about how to manage club feet. There's a lot of club foot horses that have this angle that's closer to the 60 degree mark, but yet they and they were gonna have a big upright foot. And that's, we gotta take that into consideration about the appearance. Because when I go to do surgery on a checklist surgery to drop an angle and they've got that big of a coffin bone angle in there, I'm not gonna change the appearance of that foot. And I'm not really gonna change the mechanics of that foot a whole lot. But if that same horse that has a club foot has a coffin bone angle that's closer to that, and then the palmar angle is higher, then the checklist surgery to, to put some tension in the release and the deflection tendon is gonna be more effective. Most all your coffin bones that have a steeper angle are going to be more upright, more compact, and the lower coffin bone angles are going to be longer and lower. And the reason that's important, again, just going back to if you identify that horse that's got a 32 degree coffin bone angle when he's two years old, you know he's going to have a low heel, long toe, and you need to manage, you need to manage uh, leverage in that horse. Uh, Palmar angle, which you know, I'm sure most of you guys uh, are here today are aware of a lot of these, but. Uh, Palmar angle measure. I usually use the wings as a measurement, and and I give you, I give, I'm giving you these healthy ranges, or let's say normal. Uh, and I'm not saying that every horse is in this needs to be put in this box. Not every horse needs to have a three to five degree PA. I'm just saying that horses that don't need us a whole lot, and they're just running around doing their job, wild horses, horses that we know that don't really need a whole lot of our help. These are the parameters that they kind of hang around. I'm not saying that we need to put every horse in that box, but just to give you an idea about uh, a healthy biomechanical setup that maintains itself well, we'll have these ranges. And again, the, the Palmar angle, it gives, it gives us a way to evaluate what are we doing to the deep visual flexion tension. Obviously, if we raise the Palmar angle, we're gonna put some slack in the DDF. If we lower the Palmar angle, we're gonna, we potentially are increasing tension in the DDF. And important, important aspects to think about as we're going through our biomechanical properties. The tendon surface angle, or the TSA, uh, it's measured on the distal half of the flexor surface of the navicular bone. I'm monitoring this number with regards to treating my navicular cases. If I need to unload a painful lesion in the distal half, bottom half of the navicular bone, I want to see that number increase. I want to roll through these pretty quick. We're 25 minutes in. So they're just a Again, to talk about the healthy range, uh, I'm not saying that every horse should be put into this box. I'm saying use these numbers. If this is a healthy foot, I've got good sole depth, uh, at least 15 millimeters, there's good digital alignment, there's no lameness in this horse, then a five degree PA must be healthy for it. If, if the horse has six millimeters of sole and is lame and a PA is five, it, that may not be a healthy palm angle. We'll get into the mechanics a little bit. Uh, so the suspension theory, and I, and I need to give you some thought process, I'll try to get you inside my brain so we can kind of see how the mechanics work and how the loads work. But think about the, the digit is suspended inside the hoof capsule between the lamellar bond and the deep digital flexor tendon. And it creates a sling-like effect between the digit. The frog sole digital cushion are a secondary support structure. And I think there's different trains of thought. A lot of folks think that you know the frog, the sole, and actual horn tissue is what keeps the palmar angle. And granted, that does have a lot of effect to it. However, whatever that horse is on a given day when nobody's touched it, if that palmar angle is five, that's probably what his tendon will allow it to be in, his, in the, the check leg. So again, if you imagine you're sitting here 
balance of the balls of your feet. The digit, I believe, is suspended inside the hoof capsule in a, in a similar fashion. The support structures of the sole and the frog are there to help support that suspension system. And the reason I, and I always think about extremes. If you take a foot and take all the frog and sole away, the bone will still stay suspended in the air. If you take the lamellar attachment away, the bone will displace distally. If you cut the tendon, then you'll have the toe pop up and the heel load. So if you take something away, what kind of effect would it have? You have a greater effect on when you lose the suspension apparatus than you do with the support system. But they're both important to each other. So the suspension components to me determine the loads where they're on the foot. If you have a club foot with a tight tendon, the load's in the front. If you have a low heel foot that has a low tendon tension, then your load is closer to the heel. I think about the foals that are born with contracted tendons. Uh, they're up on their tiptoes. So all the load is on the front part of the foot. Think about the foal that's born with tendon laxity, and you have all the load on the heel balls. Every horse in the world is somewhere between those two examples in all reality. Where the load is, if you push on your fingernail, it turns pale underneath the load. If the horse's foot was transparent, like my fingernail, we'd all have a lot better idea about mechanics because we'd be able to see where is that foot compressed. If you push on your fingernail, it turns pale underneath because I'm creating a vascular compression, it becomes more red on the other side. There's the same amount of blood going to my finger before and after compression. Less has to go under load and more has to go uh, to where there is a compression. So just a quick review of the anatomy. Uh, again, cannon bone, P1, P2, coffin bone, Got our deep visual flexor tendon and check ligament as part of the back door suspension apparatus, and then our lamellar bond that is the rest of the suspension apparatus. And this is another way that I look at it. Again, we look at our deep visual flexor tendon muscle as a as a hydraulic ram that's going to have a large effect on what happens to the coffin bond. And most of our lesions are either going to be in the front or the back of the foot. So if you look at the two blue areas, think about those as being smashed as, as, as you pull up on this large hydraulic cylinder of the DDF, it's going to pull this coffin bone into that toe area. That's where you're going to see a lot of load, you're going to see a bulge in the sole, you're going to see dish form in the toe. If, if, you, if you allow this hydraulic cylinder to relax, you're going to have more load underneath the wings. Just think about those biomechanics as you're looking at the foot. Another good way of looking at it from a club foot versus a crushed heel. Again, the tendon involvement and how you can affect that tendon involvement is, will alter the loads in your favor to help unload painful areas. With the club foot, we're going to be trying to, trying to manage some reduction in tendon tension. In the low foot, we're going to be concentrating a lot of leverage reduction and palmar angle enhancement. And then the tendon has to rehab itself. I think some of these, um, from a leverage standpoint, uh, when you have these horses that have a lot of leverage, when they go into training, that gives the ground a whole lot of advantage of working against the flexor tendon. And I think that muscle gets fatigued, everything gets stretched out, so then you don't have as much suspension in the back part of the foot and you start crushing that. If you think about, if you go do 100 dumbbell curls, that last 25, you can't do a full contraction, you're just sitting there doing the loose noodle arm, because you can't, do, you can't get it all the way up. But once you let your muscles rehab, recover, then you can do a full contraction. I think that Horses with a lot of leverage, they go to work, the, the flexor system gets fatigued, and then they, they become less suspended and they crush and crush and crush and get further, further negative as they train. Uh, just a slide here with a club foot and a low foot showing different load differences. If we look at the difference of the venogram here where we've highlighted the solar corium, then we're going to see that we have uh, a lot less or we're going to have more of that compression. Again, think about the tip here fingernail and how you've got that compressed. If you look at the depth from the bone, from the tip of the coffin bone to the bottom of the solar cord that's highlighted, you see the, the differences there. Uh, here in this low foot, we're obviously we're going to have a lot of load underneath the wings. You see that that vascular supply is not able to fill those areas underneath the wing. And that correlates to less growth, uh, less soul depth underneath that side, less health. You'll also see that this horse grows like this, and this one grows like this. Uh, this is a good, uh, this is in Simon Curtis's book where he does a pressure mat study again, just showing evidence of where uh, the club foot and the low foot up uh, loads. This is, a, this is the same horse, uh, 
on the same horse. You've got your club foot, you look at how the bone angle is larger. If you look at the difference between the center of rotation, your dynamic and your static toe levers are, are largely different. Uh, they're going to load different. They're going to they're going to require different mechanics. One's going to have a leverage problem its whole life. This low foot or this low suspension type foot with our deflexor tendon is going to have uh, a leverage problem. This more upright club foot has a tighter than ideal muscular tennis uh, unit of the deflexor tendon, and we're going to have a lot of load concentrated right on the tip of the cotton ball. So then we're going to have to figure out a way to manage deep digital flexor tendon tension and leverage to increase the sole depth and manage some of the tension forces that are pulling on another bond. But we cannot pick one shooting protocol that's going to fit both of those feet, even though it's on the same horse. This horse is going to have different size feet, different size shoes. Um, we can't say, well, I'm going to put break over uh, in a quarter inch in front of the coffin bone on both of these, because one that might work for it, one of them actually might even be a little bit further back from it. So it's hard for me to just pick and say, yeah, every all leverage or all re leverage reduction needs to be at this point because of the differences in the coffin bone shapes and, and, and the biomechanics of each individual horse. It's hard to it's hard to define where that's at. There's another picture. I kind of grew up on the farm, ranching, and, and I always thought about this deep flexor tendon. As you know, we've all fixed. Uh, I guess all of us have, but you know, fixed fence, fixed fence out in the pasture. You got a claw hammer. You're pulling that around the post, and I think about that kind of interaction uh, with the navicular bone. And the longer, if you can imagine, if you had a little bitty short handle, you can't get that wire very tight. But if you had a six foot handle, you could pull that wire very tight. And that's where, again, we're thinking about that leverage that we have on these horses earlier on. So, you know, we're taught a lot about balance. What is it? You know, and think about most of the time we're thinking about it, it's hard to as a human to not look at a foot and want to make a level. And I would challenge you to think about a different uh, definition in that when there is balance of lows between the suspension of the deep flexor tendon and the lamellar bond and the balance of the support, then that's when everything's in harmony or in balance. If you have too much suspension, then it throws the load more on the support of the front part of the foot. If you have too less suspension, you throw more load onto the heel of the foot. So when everything's in harmony, your support structures are not being overloaded and your, and your suspension structures are not being overloaded. Medial lateral balance determines for me, depends on what we're trying to manage because there's not one set formula for every horse. Not every horse in my practice can I sight down and make level and keep them happy. So then that's where the radiographic aspect for me comes in helpful. And it depends on what I'm trying to manage. If I'm managing hoof wall or lamellar bond, I have one thought process and joint and collateral ligament, I have the other uh, different thought process. We'll kind of go through a little flow chart here of how I determine that. So if I suspect a medial hoof balance, medial lateral hoof balance, I pick up a foot, I sight down it, and there's something uh, not right, we're out, of, we're out of whack. Of course, in my practice, I can go to an x-ray, and I know you guys are not gonna have x-rays on every horse, but uh, don't be afraid to ask for them. I think it's, it's, it's coming, I hopefully, maybe by the time my grandkids are horseshoeing veterinarians or farriers or whatever they wanna be, that uh, it's, a plan for, for a farrier to have a, to have a rate grab machine because it's really important to managing some of these horses. And I don't think a horse's feet are going to be getting any better, unfortunately. So I think it's even more crucial. So I, I'm going to take a dorsal palmar radiograph. I'm going to look at my joint space, joint space of the coffin joint. If that joint spacing is even, no matter what the coffin bone is, if it's unlevel, if the foot's level, if it's not level, if the coffin joint spacing is level, the horse is happy, has no other pathology probably trim it as he is and leave that coffin on the same. If it's not level, then I gotta have a different thought process. If my if I have hoof wall or lamellar pathology, if I do not have hoof wall or lamellar pathology, just say it's a performance horse, you got a lateral uh, uh, high outside hoof when you side it, you pick the you take an x-ray and the lateral coffin joint is compressed, I'm gonna trim to fix the coffin joint. That horse is designed to load that way his whole life. He's pushed down his medial side. He grows less on the lateral, or less on the medial aspect than he does the lateral. So within a cycle, you'll pick him up and he'll grow high on the outside. And you look at his growth rings, and you can see that his growth rings are higher on the lateral side than they are on the medial side. That's gonna be your indicator 
that says, you know what, I need to drop the lateral side of this horse. The x-rays are going to confirm that, and that you're going to have a compressed uh, joint on the lateral side. As long as there's not a quarter crack, a laminitis, or any kind of pathology on the medial, on the medial side, then I'm going, to, I'm going to do that to even the coffin joint. So what happens when, you, when you, the coffin joint grows laterally high, or the coffin joint gets compressed laterally, and you have higher growth, when you drop that, you're actually shifting the load back to the medial side again. So if you have pathology over there, like it's in this case, so if the joint is compressed opposite of the hoof wall pathology, then I'm going to leave that coffin joint out of kilter until the quarter crack is repaired or the laminitis has replaced new lamellar bonds or recovered from laminitis and replaced new bonds. So here's two examples. Both have lateral joint compression. And we're looking at this here. Both have a medial coronary band that is pushed proximal. So if you think about the hoof walls getting pushed up and the bone is pushing down, the only difference between these two scenarios is that the horse on your, your right, my right as well, has a healthy wall and a healthy lamellar suspension that can support the weight of the medial side of the golf ball. The horse on your left is a medial sinker and does not have a lamellar bond. So if I try to level that, he is still gonna push his medial wing to the ground and he's very painful. And this is one of the horses that taught me a lot about being able to play with mechanics and play with the medial lateral balance to make a horse happy. What happens is if we leave this out of balance, we've got a collateral ligament here. If we create that medial imbalance, then we're actually gonna at some point reach the end of the medial collateral ligament and it's gonna hold the medial side of the coffin bone in the air. And this horse taught me a lot because I, I just kept trying to level that coffin joint. I wanted to level that foot so bad and I would level him and he wouldn't put his foot on the ground. I could put more of a lateral lift and put him more out of balance and he would walk away. Still limping, but he would at least put his foot on the ground. And that taught me a lot of balance. Again, your medial lateral balance depends on what you're treating. If you're treating a quarter crack, leave him out of balance in the coffin joint, tilt him towards a crack, and you'll be a lot better off. Or if you've got a medial sinker, uh, keep him lateral high as well. Just another case here, and it kind of shows that you can see the growth here, growth medially, growth laterally. Then after we start implementing and leaving that coffin joint out of space, we start to get a little bit better growth medium or even medium lateral doing that. And I would do that until the hoof wall grows out, I've got a better lamellar bond, and then I'll start trying to manage that coffin joint. These horses are not, when you're leaving, an obviously a founder horse, these horses are jumping a bunch of fences or going around a barrel or standing around. Uh, some, some of my quarter crack cases, I, I still, they're still in performance, and I still tilt them towards the crack, but uh, in a sound performance horse, I'm mostly trying to manage golf. Just some tips on dorsal palmer balance front to back. So management for maintenance, ideally a 50-50 lever to heel support for maintenance around the center of the coffin joint. This horse today that we're going to shoot, there's no way to do that. There's so much coffin going out in the front of the coffin joint, it is hard to back a shoe up that far or leave that much shoe out the back and manage those levers. And that's where I think it's, it's important to try to think about how we can alter the flotation, uh, the ground surface interactions of how that, what that foot does in soft footing to where you know, a bar shoe, an onion heel, something that we can make the front of the foot penetrate the dirt a little bit better and float the back part of the foot is important. Uh, most time I'm striving for good digital alignment and most will benefit from a positive polymer angle uh, when you get outside of the realm of maintenance and you're looking at pathological problems, then all that stuff, even you can take it to the next, next level. Whereas what's healthy and for maintenance may be, be more aggressive for a pathological. Where, let's say for example, a leverage reduction shoe like the natural balance shoe may be a very good management tool for a case, but it needs to take a step up to be actually pathologic, to shoot something when it wants to get a pathological problem. I'm going to have to hurry to get this horse shot up. I'm talking way too much. So this is some helpful landmarks. Uh, when you're looking at a foot, we've got the center of rotation. There's a tip of her frog, and there's a tip of her coffin bone. And you can see it marked here on the x-ray as well. One of the things that I, that I come up with uh, in looking at different mapping procedures is, is what I call my fit in the square. But if you go from the angle of the sole out to the white line, connect those two lines. This line will give you your coffin bone. Uh, this is a really good indication for the for the wings of the coffin bone and if you break that into thirds that that back third will get you really close to the center uh, rotation of the coffin joint as well 
And that, that also follows, uh, you hear a lot of people talking about the golden means. Uh, and I've looked at a lot of coffin bones, radiographically in hand, and, and most coffin bones will follow a really good uh, proportional uh, ratio relative to that golden means. And that's a, there on your right, that's a, uh, just a picture of that same foot with that golden means uh, ratio over and over. If you see this, this guy, uh, I'm have that on the next slide, but this, this is a dot of barium that's in the back of the heel bulb, right above the frog and the heel knee. This is a dot of barium at the apex of the frog. So a really good guideline to, to think about is if you, if you sight through those two points, the apex of the frog and the back of that, the back of the, where the heel bulb meets the frog, that's a, that'll get you parallel to the bottom of the coffin hole. Just for a reference point to try, try to evaluate, is it a positive PA or is it a negative PA? Something I think about a lot of my practice is my level of mechanics have to match my level of pathology. I can't, uh, I can't take a high-end laminitis case and put a flat shoe on with a leverage reduction and expect the same results. I have to be the degree of damage, the degree of pain with the navicular, the degree of damage in the tendon. I have to be, I have to pair the amount of mechanical change that I'm offering and load change with the degree of damage. So these are just some of the things that I commonly use in my practice every day. Uh, the very first one, like you know, maybe a maintenance for a lot of horses, flat shoe with reduced leverage. I don't have a whole lot of those in my practice. I don't know if any of you tell you the truth, but you know, move up the scale, move up the ladder of pathology, move up the the, the scale as well with level of mechanics. So just some, you can read all those things on the left. Uh, I use a lot of rocker shoes uh, in different degrees whether it's a little bitty tiny rocker or a, a lot of rockers with a lot of wedge to start with. And that's determine how effective I need to be in that system um, relative to that pathology is, is it helps me make my choices. The same token is I'm, I can't take a high scale laminar failure and expect the same results by putting a maintenance shoe on for that horse. And at the same token, I'm not gonna do it's not me on a horse that doesn't have a problem. So it's, it's where in your own practice and what you're dealing with every day, you gotta ask your veterinarian what, what what level of problem we're dealing with, how lame is this horse, how much damage do we have, and then you're gonna pair the level of mechanical differences with that. Then confirmation, we may have to move on to and actually talk about this with the horse, but a whole horse whole limb extorsion where the whole leg faces out, the elbows are tucked in, toes are faced out. They compress the inside and the medial side of the foot and they grow lateral high. Those are the ones that you're constantly having to drop on the lateral side. Carpal valgus, that's where the knee turns out below the, below the carpus. Also loads at the axial part. There's a radial metacarpal malalignment where the, uh, a lot of people hear this as an offset knee where that puts the coffin bone and the cannon bone outside the center of the radius. Also loads at the medial side. This is not real common in adult horse, but you still see it, and obviously that's going to alter load. You're going to load up the outside of your hoof a little bit more and the outside of your joints. Spiral torsion is one I see a lot of. Uh, again, this, this is where everything is rotated around, and I see it most of the time in the, see our, our carpus is facing this way, our fetlock is facing that way, and our toe is facing that way. So there's actually a split or a spin rotation inward of the cannonball. That, the rotation for me depends on whether they push up their heel or they push up the quarter. If they push up the quarter, those are the ones to me that are more likely to get cord grabs. So the further that is rotated around, then it puts the load, port, puts the load more towards the quarter of the toe. If, it, if, it stay toe, if they stay toed out and it's on the heel, as that spirals back around, it seems like they want to load more towards the quarter of the toe. That, that's also what they, uh, when you fold that leg up, they want to heal out. So when that foot flops out to you, it really makes it nice to shoot because it, uh, it's easier to get under. Fetlock varus is going to deviate your load towards the outside. This is how I evaluate for it. I'll pick up that, pick up that leg, kind of fold it up, and then I'm looking at this orientation between the cannonball and the passion to try to identify that. That's going to, that's going to place your, your limb more actually or more towards midline. You're going to end up loading your outside more, and that's... Uh, Almost all horses have a low grade varus in all reality. It's the higher grade problems with all of these that end up being a problem. So this is the horse today. These are some x-rays from a few months back. Uh, we're going to try to take new ones today uh, so we can kind of see where we're at. 
But just, just to roll through some of the some of the concepts that we see. As we, so we get this horse, we think about our center rotation of the coffin joint, drop a line parallel. Obviously we got a lot of leverage there. Now if we think about how how can I shoe this horse, I could probably fit a shoe back to there pretty easily. And, and if I'm gonna try to maintain a 50-50 ratio, then I'm, am I gonna set a shoe back that far? That's a tough foot to fit back that far to get rid of and balance that leverage. Otherwise you're having to leave a shoe hanging out that far out the back. And that horse can't go do his job. He's pulling a shoe off every couple of days and you're having to go back out there and put it back on. So these are tough feet to manage. And, and this is a sound horse today. He's a three-year-old. Uh, this is a horse that I see commonly five to eight years of age with deep visual flexion tendonitis, bursitis. They have coffin joint hyperextension injuries. Uh, they can even get as far as getting some suspension injuries. So this is a case that, that I wanted to do today to, to, to bring to light this type of foot that I think if we manage these horses better when they're two and three and in training, then I think that if we extend their effective career where they're uh, you know, not getting a coffin joint person that they're over 60 days by the time they're four or five years old. So just for an example, uh, for some of the things that, how, how can we shoot this horse? So let's, let's just go through a few options. So obviously uh, we're thinking about the So, obviously, we're going to try to get as much heel support as possible. Uh, we're going to try to get our break over as far back as possible. So, if we, if we get it that extended, then it's putting a rocker toe on would be a bare minimum rocker to roll toe to try to get that balanced around those two. You get that low angle of a roll toe, it doesn't have as much effect, I don't think. So, other things that I would do. Uh, in a case like this to help increase the flotation of the back part of the foot and increase the penetration of the front part of the foot is to have a wider branch that either the section gets smaller towards the heel and is wider towards the back so you can run and kind of go fast. So again, trying to create flotation in the back part of the foot and penetration in the front. When they're going into soft footing, because we can't we're never going to balance that foot. There's, there's, we're never going to keep, keep as much toe in front as heel as, as we do behind because of the way that horse is designed. More than likely, what I will do today will involve somewhat of a, a aluminum shoe with a little bit of a wedge. It kind of depends on how much foot we have. But in cases like this, I will use those same concepts, but then I will trim the foot and then just a little bit of a slight or a roll. And what that does for me is, is these horses will always usually grow plenty of depth at the toe, but I can manage that horse instead of trying to manage in one single plane. I can manage the front part of the foot and trim a better cast to the palmar angle in, and then the crushed heel or what, what heel that he does have is never going to grow upright. You know, no matter how hard you try, you're never going to turn this into an upright clubby foot. But we can load the healthy foot and put a nice general roll from toe to heel. It's a nice way to manage these guys. This would be a step up for me uh, from just say a flat shoe with an aggressive leverage reduction. And so that would be the first shoe I talk about with the leverage reduction. That's gonna be a bare minimum maintenance for this horse. And I think changing our perception, especially on the veterinary side, when they see veterinarians that pick up a foot and they see it's got a uh, you know, wedge aluminum shoe with a rock toe, and they think, oh, this horse must be lame. You know, there must be a problem. You know, then they end up discouraging the buyers from buying it because there's a problem. But in all reality, this horse needs a different level of maintenance than a normal perimeter fits to the shoe. And I think if we change our perception, uh, change our veterinary perception as well, that it's okay to have a different biomechanical setup for a foot like this and it still be healthy. It's, uh, it's actually being proactive, trying to be healthy and keep this horse going on. So that's our plan. Here's his right foot, kind of the same thing. So we'll take some new x-rays today. Let's bring that horse in and get rolling. Any questions while we're getting set up here? Anybody? Was that that good of a talk that I just answered every question we possibly had? I know, on that, on that uh, are you going to lower on that box immediately? Uh, Were you gonna let's, take, let's take x-rays today, right. and we'll see what but he's I, I, 
the joint spacing was it looked great out here, but he still looked like the so that's he was high. So his question is the the coffin bone was needly high, right? But the coffin joint was needy. So that's where it's difficult from the fair standpoint. point. So you look at that and you want to you want to drop, drop that. So if, if the coffin joint is even, I would probably leave it that way. Because there's a lot of them that have deviations that cause growth to be that way, but. What makes the coffin joint happy may not make the hoof capsule happy. And what makes the hoof capsule happy may not make the coffin joint happy. All right, because I know you, you said that when it started, but yes. I just didn't know if that at the end. We'll, we'll see how he see how is today. He's kind of got a weird list to it. Yeah. So my practice is in Collinsville, Texas. I for the last probably at least 10 years have pretty much been a for sure with an extra machine. So, you know, I, I mostly deal with uh, all, you know, all lame horses, a lot of laminitis cases. I have a practice there in North Texas with seven kind of intensive care unit stalls for really bad laminitis cases. And uh, a lot of those, when you start thinking about how to manage extreme mechanical defaults, it teaches you a lot about what you can do to these lesser cases and still be effective change things on a much greater level. So, a lot of low level type mechanical cases that just need some maintenance. Um, obviously, you can hand make a lot of stuff. Uh, I like these KB aluminum wedges because of, they're kind of a nice blank slate. I can do a lot of forging modifications to manipulate these. Uh, they're pretty affordable. Uh, there's some shoes that, that I have built out myself that have a lot of these, that have a lot of these, uh, have a lot of these modifications built into them. Uh, I make them in a four and a six degree. I used to hand make all these, but just it's a lot easier to have a machine make them. But uh, so in my upper level cases, I'm using four and six degree wedges that are actually rockered. This is kind of a maintenance shoe for, for a lot of my horses that, that maybe they recovered or maybe I'm uh, just managing biomechanics. I'll use this two degree aluminum wedge and then again put a little bit of a rocker into it. Still pretty wide eyed. Give him a little bit more. Check, check, check. There we go. So, when you're evaluating the graphs, it's also important to know how they were taken. So, as usually when I'm really worried about me and lateral balance, then you want to. Make sure the whole, we're trying to keep the horse, horse right in front of his front legs. I don't want any kind of motion. I want to know the ground's level. That way I can evaluate whether my joint spacing is. I think you do better. Just trying to evaluate whether your joint spacing is even or not. It's also important to know how the extra is taken. If they've been taking them on one block, one foot setting off, then it's hard to evaluate your joint spacing. And honestly, I don't check. I don't really believe many x-rays that I don't take myself when it comes to the joint. Basic, because even even I know when I take it, I wonder. Well, I wonder if he leans just a little bit. Let me see this stuff right here. Oh, what? Right there. Right there. Oh, but oh, son, oh, son, not that good. Image data. Three arming panel. Waiting for Let's just say blunt. <laughs> oh, but this is probably a lot for me to think about. That's for sure.
got that one in the retake. Oh, there it is. For some reason, it's really slow. X ray detected. Okay. So again, these x-rays look pretty similar to what we had a few months ago. Um, if we were to go through here and take some measurements, we look at our bone angle. Bone angle is right around 42 degrees. So if you have a healthy, nice, well-balanced mechanical foot, that angle will be closer to 50 degrees. So then your internal structure is creating a much higher, more compact foot. You measure a palmar angle. That's the bottom of the coffin bone relative to a level world. About two plus, or two, 2.4. And again, we've, like we've identified, we've got we're looking from the center of rotation forward. There's a lot of leverage out front. And again, these are, these are tough ones to maintain because of that. And that whole time this leverage is, and I'm not saying that 50-50 is the ideal. I don't know that anybody really knows what an ideal is, but I know a lot greater leverage reduction is better than none. Um, if we look at his coffin joint spacing here on the dorsal palmar radiograph on the left front, we see that our joint spacing laterally is a little tighter than it is medially. So in this case, we look, we pick up that foot, we'll pick it up and sight down the limb. And I would think that I would want to drop that horse on the outside of my trim today to try to level the coffin joint. If this horse had a quarter crack on the medial side or was found on the medial side, I would leave that joint out of whack to help unload the medial cord. Right front, DP and lateral. coffin bone is a very similar angle and you'll see a lot of horses that'll have a four degree difference on both sides this one's 40 degrees or thereabouts and almost 42 and we look at sole depth he's got about eight or nine millimeters uh, I think this horse lost a shoe a couple times so then he's probably lost some foot with that but so we think about managing a foot like this we've got to figure out a way to manage leverage to keep the tendon from getting sore. Uh, what also happens, these horses wanna, don't wanna grow real well just because I think they get a lot of compression in the front part of the foot. So then they don't, they don't get the nutrient supply and the health that they need to. So again, managing forces to keep this foot less unloaded in the front, working against the tendon, typically results in a little bit healthier foot. If we look here on his right front, so we look at the medial side, you guys, can you guys see my arrow on the, on the x-ray that tough. good? Is it kind of wobbly? Everybody getting seasick? <laughs> so if we look at our joint spacing here, our medial side is compressed, and even though the coffin bone is actually lower on the medial side, I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably work to try to drop him to the medial side to try to level that coffin joint. Now, you know, we don't have a ton of foot, so then relative to what you do in the trim, sometimes you gotta make up in your shoe. Uh, and I'm not saying you have to get it all today because this horses are the the hoof capsule and the coffin joint is just the greatest in the world being able to adapt to different things and it's not going to go bad on one day the same token is you don't have to fix it all in one day you know a couple of showings where you got more foot and you kind of slowly trim towards that is uh is the ideal case you better wrap the front up pull that up this was the one that was kind of lost some of her light there try to come right over the top here where you can see straight down like that right there this one. So when you slide down the leg, it actually looks pretty level. But radiographically, joint space and still being a little compressed to me, I'd want to drop him just a skosh. That's good. So let's talk about things that you, you're not gonna have an x-ray to see all that, right? Right off the bat on all these horses. If we look at those landmarks, uh, which we didn't get to cover a whole lot, and, and a lot of the things that you see published are, are fairly accurate. But one of the things that I, I like to look at is where the bars terminate into the sole. And that's a very accurate representation for me. So if we look where the bars terminate, where, where, about where my thumbs are, 
that's the center of rotation of the coffin joint. So the very first time you ever pick up this foot, horse's foot and you find that point, you see that, hey, my gosh, I've got 90%, 80% of my coffin bone out front. This is something I've got to work on from day one to reduce leverage. How long is this horse in the shoe? Not very long, because he lost a, a shoe. Uh, I think he's only been shot a week, but I think he tried to leave me as much foot as possible. Because he had lost a shoe a couple times. So today, in order to be somewhat effectual, you'll get to see a little bit of a, a real subtle full rocker trim, in which I'll, I'll go down here right at the, right at the uh, juncture of the white line and the wall and dig down, just kind of give me a little bit of a depth gauge. And then I'm going to essentially put a rocker toe in this foot. Hey, Doc, do you want more light? Uh, uh, light wouldn't, wouldn't hurt my feelings. Yeah. We'll get it. Is this thing working? <laughs> and again, when I'm doing this, I'm also keeping in mind that joint balance. But I know that I don't have a whole lot of foot mass, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna rob mass to fix my balance today. We've already identified that we've only got seven or eight millimeters of sole. So I can't do I can't do everything that I want. Huh? It's going in and out. Yeah. I don't know what to do about that. Come come gather around. Yeah. So then the, the heel trim component of this. Um, if we look at these heels, you can see where they kind of caved in here just a little bit on the lateral side. Uh, and these are the types, and this is just all nature of the beast. I'm not necessarily saying that the last person who shot this horse did anything other than try to help this horse. This horse is just one that's going to have some trouble uh, with his heels because of where he naturally loads it. So when I trim this heel, I'm just going to put a little slight rocker in the heel to get down to some solid horn, and then I can fit my shoe as far back as where the frog and the horn touch. And I typically like, you know, I like to fit the front of the foot the best that I can. All right, so for this case, I would identify this as a low-end mechanical knee, but, but I still want to be more than just a flat shoe because I, you know, I don't have a whole lot of foot mass, and I think I can jump start this foot with just a little bit of mechanics. And like I said, I, I like these KB aluminums because I can, it's just kind of a nice blank slate. I can take and put a lot of, a lot of different modifications in this and then add a little rocker to it and be a low-level uh, mechanical advantage. So you'll see when I get into, to, you know, that a lot of this stuff is not that much different than everyday shooting, except for, I think, the, the trim allows me, I think, to be a little bit more effectual in changing the palm or angle than being able to put this little bit of roller motion into it. Again, I think about the roller motion is it's easier to roll a 100-pound ball than it is a 100-pound box. Uh, they, they normally kind of move through this anyway. I won't burn my shoe over here. They normally kind of move through the dirt rolling anyway. When we get in the way of that, I think it's when we start adding more leverage uh, to the system. What I'll do with this first is I like to fit mine pretty tight just because I don't like I don't like leaving anything to, for it to grab. So check my temperature here with my hammer handle. Once it kind of slides off there pretty good, and also just listen to it. It should still have a nice ring to it. I'm gonna put me a little bit of a convenience bend in that. And I'm gonna force me a taper heel in this just because again I like to I'm gonna suck my heels in pretty tight. seems to make it easier to be able to do that. Second thing is, is 
because of the type of nails I like to use, I'm going to run this forward through my crease. And as I carry this back, I want to aim for the inside. If you come up on top here, yeah. I want to aim for the inside of this onion heel so I can push that out. And that's where I'm going to try to gain some of my flotation. Be just as you know, as line of sight, we might be just a little skosh high laterally. And I prefer, I prefer this method versus just pulling the foot forward and backing it up, because I, I, I think that a lot of the strength of the foot is in the toe. So if we look here, where you know we we can back this foot up, that's one technique. But if we look, our hoof wall is is all pretty thin. And it's only that way up to where, it's not like the whole hoof wall's been thinned out, it's just that last little quarter inch. But this is a way that I've been able to not have to, not have to back a foot up from the front because a foot like this, you can back all the way through the horn zone and still not be enough. You ready?
feel like this if I'm gonna put a little bit of a rocker in it. I like I like the extra mass that a wedge offers to help keep that foot floating. I don't, I don't want these guys ever rocking back. They just need to kind of set their foot down and move forward. You can do this with you know a, a more evenly balanced foot. You, know, you can do it with just a flat shoe, but I think that uh, I like I like the added mass that I can get from the wedge. Yes, I can. It's just going to beat the shoe up. Like on this, on that, on at home, I've got an anvil that's got that ground off. Basically, you can take it on the step. And just do the same thing. Basically, you just need three points of contact. There's one. You need two to go in between. I might take a blanket off of him, Doug. He might be getting sweaty. Pretty hot underneath there. So again, when I'm putting the rocker in this, I also want to be thinking about my anatomy. I know that rockers need to be placed to be uniformly successful right at the center rotation of the coffin joint. So when I'm rocking that, I'm thinking, you know, that's in this horse, it's way back here. So most of my, this is gonna be really, really subtle, but most of it needs to be right here towards the back. So because of this technique requires a whole lot of little tinkering, uh, I've built this stall jack to take next to me. I just set the horse's foot in my knee make little minor alter, alterations. Instead of having to come back and forth to the amble 19 gazillion times, I prefer to have this thing sitting right next to me. Then I'll first make this fit the perimeter. Then I'll worry about fitting my rocker trim. Look at that, uh, there's another hammer over there, Caleb. I have no shame using a stall jack. Not at all.
I, uh, I spend a lot of time on my knees, mostly praying for what I do, but um, I just, I don't know, I've just always done that, and I think versus having to bend over, maybe I can figure that if I could get a knee replacement, but I can't really get a back replacement. So maybe it'll save me in the end, I don't know. Then once I get my pruner where I like it, I'm just going to tweak here a little bit to get to fit my trim. And then I start making decisions about where and how much rocker. And this is a very low level mechanical need, so we know we don't need a whole lot. And I, I think when I first started learning this approach from Dr. Red, you know, I wanted to go home and put these great big rockers on everything, and I think I've learned that its most success is in its subtlety. Just doing a little bit. It blows people's minds a little bit less as well. Then I'll set them down on it and see how the fit is and see how they utilize it. And I usually just fit the capsule. Uh, this one's got this caved in heel, but I'm not going to really follow it. That's getting pretty close. When I'm looking down this toe too, I want to look at it to make sure I don't have any. Looking down through my toe, make sure I got a little daylight between the toe, especially on the horse that doesn't have a whole lot of foot mass. Make sure I got a little daylight between my, I need to create a little bit, it looks like. I'm looking at daylight in between these two points. So I look down the front of that shoe, I want to see a little thin gap of air, or light right there, but I'm not putting any kind of sole pressure. But when you look at the trim, you know, we're used to leaving a little bit of a rim of a hoof wall there to be, to be shot to. Here the, the wall and the sole is on the same level. But my primary load points are over here uh, at the toe pillars. So this one I can't hardly get down. I don't know if it's because of my big hiney or what, but I can't I can't trim this foot the same way they do the other one. I have to sit down here beside it, and I'm gonna take the opportunity to see what kind of the, the heel that we have. But yet I'm gonna I'm gonna try to where our load bearing surface stops right here, right now. I want to increase that by almost a full inch by bringing the shoe a little bit further back. So I'm trying to get more of that shoe and more of that heel loaded. By just, um, I'm going to put just a little slipper heel or rocker heel, whatever you want to call it. And that, you know, that was a hard thing, a hard concept for me to, you know, all the time I'm trying to, I've been trying to gain heel, and then I, then I just start taking it off like this. But I think about that I'm, I'm replacing it with prosthetic heel, but by, by also while trying to load it further back. So the prosthetic palmar angle that I'm applying is in the action of the shoe, plus in the design of the shoe being a wedge. So 
Well, some things too that I've learned, especially in pleasure horses, is that we're, we're always trying to manage what's good for the foot and good for the horse, but also doesn't make it move like a draft. So then I have been pretty successful with very low end mechanics. In some of my cases that require higher end mechanics, I find that I find that the more mechanics you give them, the more barker, the more knee action they get on some of them, and they don't like that knee action. So then you have to have a talk with your clients. Like, well, here's what's going to keep the horse sound. It's going to affect his movement. He may not be winning Congress anymore, but he's going to be sound. But there's a, there's a, you know, a lot to, a lot to think about. For a lot of the cases, for me, come to me lame. They're just happy if they're sound. If they can actually go back to the show pit, they're pretty happy. feet like this they're dang near straight from the quarter back is a real straight slanted in heel and I can that's a that's just a it's not a foot it's not a foot for me that that flows good when you're shaping it. You know just a lot of little little sharp corners you gotta follow. Not that I expect everybody to go home and start throwing rockers on everything, but I'd say take it, take away from today that leverage reduction is important. Oh, my knife went too. Um, but also realize that there are other ways that you can go about it to help improve the situation. I'd say a bare minimum using a flat shoe. Really try to focus on young horses and managing leverage. But you can go lots of places and learn how to put on a flat shoe. So I figured we would take the opportunity to do something a little different. And the crowd goes wild, right? <laughs> Everybody's so quiet.
problem turning them out with this kind of shoe? I hope not. <laughs> Haven't yet. What what aspect would you have problems turning pull out? Them off. Pull them off. No, um, I, they actually stay better for me. And again, uh, this one I'm not going to be able to fit as quite as tight as I'd want. But I, I usually fit them pretty tight and put a pretty tapered heel on them just because of that. I don't, most of my horses, very few of my horses, you know, I'd say maybe half of my horses are within 50 mile radius of my clinic. But I spend a lot of time on the road and those horses are a long ways away and I don't like to leave anything out for them to pull. All right, I think we'll let that roll. Nobody. So I like to go ahead and put a, a nice taper to the heel, uh, mainly just because I don't like to create that grab there. Um, and that's probably a little steeper on that one than I normally do, but maybe just try to take that corner off. It also helps when, when you walk up and look at this shoe, it, it creates an illusion where you just, you, just, you just see shoe. If you leave that point out there, especially uh, if you're using some of these rockers a lot, and somebody sees that great big heel that's stuck up out to the back and start scratching your head and trainers are about to put their lid because the heel's not touching the ground. You put that little taper on there and I'd say 90% of people walk by my shoulders don't realize that they have a big rock and all that. Uh, let me see how this fits up and then we'll kind of flip and ramble, tack it on, take some ready grabs. It's pretty, pretty thin wall. Pretty thin sole. Check those nail holes. This nail here is a JC Double Lot. I think they make them for the racing side. They're a nice little small nail. You're kind of an E-style head. Um, especially on feet that are thin like this. And, and actually most all my horses. I, I put a little hook in all mine. And that's a technique that, I've, you know, we've all used a bunch to get a nail out. Uh, but I met Dr. Redden, and he talked about it from the standpoint of how effective it can be from, you know, maintaining hook wall. Where if you drive, if you drive a straight nail, which you know, a lot of us still do, then your, your horn or your nail is going to come in. It's going to go along the wall straight up, and then it's going to, somewhere as it gets superficial, you're going to, you're going to lose a, a big triangular chunk of hook wall which on feet that are growing well and got great hoof wall, that is of no detriment, I mean, that's, that's fine. A lot of feet like this that, you know, it, they're not growing fast. If I keep getting a nice high nail, knock a little chunk out, come back next to it, knock a big chunk out, the next thing you know, I'm having to glue that horse, especially if we ever lose a shoe. So the concept behind driving a little hook nail, the nail ends up being almost a little more circular inside the hoof capsule. So again, here's my hoof wall. Here's how my nail's gonna go in. It's going to enter a little bit steeper than it would. I'm just going to kind of massage it, and then it's going to come across the wall and exit across the wall versus through the wall, so I create less damage to the superficial wall layers. So what, what you'll see is you'll have a, a perfectly square nail exit hole versus a triangular flap, and then the clinch will be exactly where the hole is punched out, where when you drive a straight nail, you punch that triangular flap in, and then you gouge below it, and then you're putting it below that. So this way, it comes out and you just fold the clinch over and you've got a full thickness of hoof wall there that your clinch is in. And also think about too, that the, the, nail will be, the nail will be a full circle, not a full circle, but it'll have an arc to it. So if you think about just walking to a door frame and reach up with your fingers and grab the top of the door frame, all the load is right there on your fingers. And you're suspended by right there at your fingers. I think of that as your clinch. Obviously there's friction of the nail that's holding you there as well. I don't, you know, I think the clinch, as several people have proved, is probably not that important. Uh, we don't put clinches on the on the two before's that we hold houses together with so I think but there's probably more movement But anyway, when you think about this You've got a clinch at the end of a long arm. So now think about grabbing that door jam But now you've got a piece of pipe right here So now that load is that downward moment on that load is spread out over a larger arc I think you have less less pull on your clinch And 
And for feet that aren't growing as fast, you know, this this type of nail technique, I, I can put a nail, I feel confident putting a nail right next to another nail hole. And uh, I don't usually find myself pulling a clinch out. It's probably reduced my amount of forces that I have to glue by uh, quite a bit. <clears throat> When I drive that crooked nail, especially on a thin wall horse, I'm actually getting really close to the inside of the terminal lamina. How many people call the white line the terminal lamina? Raise your hand. The white line where everything comes together. Is that what everybody calls the white line? How many people think of the white line as that non-pigmented ring in the stratum internum? And that's where you put your nails. Anybody? That's just a wide variation I noticed across different people call the white line different things. So this is gonna to be towards the inside of the terminal lamina, very close to the sole. And I started out and I'm just gonna start tippity tapping and I'm gonna walk it through that danger zone. If he starts giving me a little bit of a reason that he, he can feel that, then you know you need to stop. Versus if you're driving a straight nail, most of the time, you don't know you stuck him until you've already got it halfway driven home. All right, I'm gonna tack the other side on and we'll shoot some radio Yeah, just fucking around. I'm sorry, I'm used to everybody working on the horse. Two feet. Yeah. Let's yeah. forward a little bit, doesn't it? No ride of cord. There we go. Perfect. For x-ray purposes, I always like to make sure that my nail heads are seated well into the crease. I don't want them behaving, changing the behavior of my shoes. Sometimes I even got to rest them off a little bit. Something we didn't talk about, about this horse that I skipped, is just uh, how to evaluate the limb conformation. So uh, we'll run through that and we'll take some x-rays. Let's go back this a little bit. So, that's a Yeah. I'll try cool. to drop it. No, no, you'll do fine. So, when I first look at a first look at a horse and I start my limb evaluation, I, I, I face up myself perpendicular to the face of the knee. 
So the face of the knee, if you look over from the top, wherever that flattest, more, most uh, flattest spot of the face of the knee is, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get perpendicular to that. And then I start looking down my leg to see what do I gotta do to be in line if I were to shoot an arrow through the condyles of the fetlock, where do I have to be to shoot directly through that? So here I'm at the face of my knee, but in order to be perpendicular and run right through the center of my fetlock joint, then I've gotta come over here. So I've got a slow grade spiral in torsion in the cannon bone. A lot of times you can go right over the, I'll, I'll take my phone on my camera on my phone and put my phone perpendicular to the face of the knee and then look down at the fetlock. And I take a lot of pictures like that so I can see what that lower leg is doing. So to me, this horse has a low grade spiral in torsion. Uh, I would put it, I have a classification system of one through five. I would put this in that one to two range, very low grade. And if you look at all your books, they talk about these perfect ideal limbs. This should bisect this and this should be parallel to the ground. The coffin bush should be parallel to the ground. And if you look at a lot of those, they're drawings because they can't find a picture of a real horse that's that way. <laughs> So almost every horse, it's more natural to have some sort of deviation than it is to be perfectly straight. At least, I think my view is probably skewed a lot by the types of horses that I work on. I think that a, a lot of them having problems are obviously gonna have greater levels of deviations, but every horse to some degree has a deviation. Uh, also looking at the, uh, how the, how the metacarpus, can you guys see that red dot? Perfect. So I'm gonna use that red dot as a pointer. So that, as that, Radius comes down, I'm looking at how does it tie in with the fetlock, excuse me, the carpus, and then what does the cannon bow do below that? And if you look at him, there's a very low grade carpal valgus, meaning that he, he, he deviates outward from the carpus or from his knee after that. Uh, and there may be just a little slight radial carpal metacarpal, a radial metacarpal malalignment or an offset knee, to where if you look at the center of the cannon bone and then look at the center of the radius, they're just offset just a little bit. All very low grade, and I always tell my owners, they start hearing me talk about all these abnormalities this horse has got, and they think they, oh my gosh, I thought he was so pretty and straight-legged. But what I found is that the higher level of detail that I started looking at horse's feet with and horse's limbs with is that I started finding there's a lot of deviations there that, you know, you walk up to this horse and think, he's, ah, he's not too bad. But as you start really breaking it down into each little bone and joint, you start finding a lot of deviations. So with a horse like this that has a low-grade spiral and a little bit of an offset cannon bone, so that puts the whole bottom of the foot to the outside a little bit. This is a horse that's gonna load that medial side up a little bit more. He's probably gonna compress his growth on the medial side, so he's gonna grow lateral high every day of his life as he grows, because there's more compression on the medial side, he's gonna get a little bit high on the outside. Horses like this that have this conformation, but to a much higher degree, they love to blow a quarter crack, or they like to have a sheared heel, depending on where, how much spiral there is to go around. Uh, so then when I'm looking at pre-purchase exams, I'm looking at that kind of stuff as well to help, to help the owner with. Same thing on this one. So then I'm gonna look, I'm gonna get parallel to my, or perpendicular to the face of my knee. Then I'm gonna start looking down that limb to see what do I gotta do. There's not quite as much spiral here, so I don't have to change quite as much position to get around to, the, to shoot straight through the fetlock. And then I look through the center of the toe. And also looking down Again, I'm trying to get perpendicular to the face of the knee. Then I'm gonna look down and see how that limb rotates inward. I'm gonna give this back to you sure. and we'll show fetlock varus. Okay. When I'm looking for fetlock varus, fetlock varus is the definition where the hinge joint of the fetlock is tilted, right? And it's always gonna be higher. So if, you look at, if you're looking at the front, if you're looking at the fetlock joint, it's always gonna be higher on the medial side. Tilted like that, always. Fetlock valgus doesn't actually exist uh, in nature. So when I'm looking at fetlock varus, I'm gonna fold that leg up and come try to come straight down mm -hmm. over his elbow there. And I'm looking at this line down the cannon bone, down the pasturing, and that'll give me an idea about how the hinge joint here is tilted. So that the fetlock varus usually will tilt the leg further to the axial side of the inside and load the outside foot more. I saw a horse with a, probably an off the scale fetlock varus and he was almost walking on the side of his foot and it, you just start to see how the load's different based off of that. When you start seeing extreme versions of each one, 
it kind of helps you figure out what the low the low end mechanics are also doing. So we need to face them. Let's just face it that way. That'd be easy to get radiation away from those folks. And we kind of shoot this one right here. Deep in yeah. the <laughs> you make sure this is up. Let's scoot him forward a little bit. That way if he goes backwards. Lee, catch him if he goes backwards. So again, with, with, with not enough foot mass, I'm not going to worry too much about whether I perfectly correct my joint spacing today. If I'm really worried about it and I think it's causing a problem for him, then I will take the shoe to the grinder or I beat. I can't, I can't change his joint balance relative to trimming his foot because I'm not going to diminish his mass. <laughs> to, to, to improve his balance. I want to get mass first and then I'll start affecting my balance. But like I said, you can take and do things to the shoe itself. Is there any question on that? How would that shoe wear if you didn't do anything at all? Uh, it's it's going to wear in the areas that he naturally loads anyway. So he's probably going to wear his medial side off here. That's where he naturally loads and a little bit more on the lateral side. And then oftentimes too, I'll, I'll look at the the face of the knee kind of guides my breakover. So if I if I see that his his knees face out, then when I'm grinding this or forging this, I'm also rolling a little bit to the outside toe quarter. That's one of the things that I don't really like the squarish toed leverage reduction shoes because I'm kind of locked in there and I'm going to have to take that corner out. So I think I get the same effect of leverage reduction by forging the toe and rocking the fully rockering, and I can fit the perimeter, save my hoof wall, and then and allow this arc to not be a corner that they can roll over on. What do we need to do to the extra uh, I mean, <clears throat> Going left or right first? Doesn't matter. Make sure you're standing good. Getting image data. Three arming panel. So I just quick made some quick measurements here. So the palmar angle change, I'll show it to you when you pulled it up. We had a 2.4 degree palmar angle, and now we're up to a 6.1. So we, we increased the PA by trim mechanics of the shoe. Uh, on this foot, because there there wasn't a whole lot of trim, if we look at the if we look at my shape, you can kind of see the shape of the shoe. Where actually a lot of that rocker is right in the back, and that's mainly because I, I would rather it not be that abrupt. But in all reality, uh, because there wasn't a whole lot of foot to mess with, and I want to leave as much of this sole depth as possible, uh, and but be sure that my rocker is well behind the center rotation of the coffin joint. And that's that's how I'm going to leave him. And th those heels are you know kind of folded and run in, so I'm going to get a lot of that folded horn tubules off and then load that load that with that shoe and when that when that rocker's back that far you should never see that horse rock back ever so if you if you see a horse walk off and they're rocking back then you got to change the program uh, so the, the the dynamic toe lever change from 82 millimeters to 55 millimeters almost a 30 millimeter reduction in leverage just from a static standpoint uh, from a dynamic toe lever standpoint uh, the tendon surface angle, again, there was a study done that for every degree that we change the angle that we alter the load on the tendon and navicular bone by 4%. So their tendon surface angle changed from 28 degrees to 32 degrees. That's not a lot, but that's 4 degrees. We, have, we unloaded the navicular bone a little bit. I think that that's helpful to, uh, to think about from the standpoint of, again, we're, we're shooing for the future today. And 
you know, once this horse has a little bit better soul depth and wall quality, I, I'll start trying to lower some of these mechanics out and then, and then visualize or try to monitor how, what's my soul depth doing? What, what is my hoof caps doing? Can I get by with less mechanics? Can this horse go to a flat shoe? Uh, and I would think that one of, the, one of the key things for me as to why I like this approach is because just like that, I changed, uh, left all of his soul depth today, but I was able to alter the biomechanical properties in his favor with very little trim. Didn't do a whole lot to the foot. Where trying to manage that in one single flat plane has been hard for me to advance it that next step. But there's no harm in trying to manage this foot at bare minimum. I'm not saying everybody has to go out and do this. This is what I have to do to get a lot of my horses sound. I'm saying recognize that this horse has a leverage problem and work towards managing leverage. However much you want to try to break, to, to you feel comfortable with bringing back, managing the horse's movement, manage, managing the hoof capsule, uh, make an effort to do that. I think that we like to think about that there's a lot of guidelines out there, but I don't think anybody really knows what the ideal leverage is. There's no way to really prove that. I think we have to look at the parameters of the foot, soul depth, is the horse staying sound, then that might be okay. If the horse is unsound, soul depth is thin, walls are thin, we got to rehab that foot, then maybe we need to be more advantageous with our mechanical changes. You guys can't see all of that. Let's look at the right one. We're working on it. Alrighty. So that you see that little marker in my in all my radiographs, the two dots. So that is a there's two systems out that have a automatic calibration. So there's automatically magnification in every X-ray because what we're measuring is that far off the plate. So just like if you put a flashlight against your hand and your hand's right against the wall, then you get a silhouette or a shadow of exactly what your hand is, pretty much. The closer you bring your hand to the flashlight, the more magnified that image is. So in every radiograph, there's at least 10% magnification from the center of the hoof to the, to the radiograph plate. So when we're considering that, this little marker that we put in the plane of interest will automatically correct for that magnification. And I like it because it's a way for me to be somewhat consistent in comparing radiograph to radiograph. Run through here and take a couple of measurements. So the palmar angle in this horse changed from 5.3 to 7, just a couple degrees change. Probably the most significant thing is that, that toe lever that's working against us. Uh, and I think some of this goes away as well in soft footing, obviously. The, and how this thing is going to act in soft footing is different than what it acts on my blocks. And I did a lot of my cases where I was having some trouble with different horses. And I, so I started x-raying them. I, whatever their training arena was, I went and grabbed a dirt full of their, a box full of their dirt in a little Tupperware container and I would set it on top of my block, let them set their foot down in, kind of work them back and forth a couple times and I'd start x-raying feet to see how it interacted in the footing itself. And that's where I started identifying that, you know, you really got to pay attention to these ground surface interactions where what looks good on the block isn't what you're getting in the dirt. I was losing Palmar angle, uh, the heels were sinking in the ground on, on certain shoeing cases and on those Devicar horses, they don't really like for the heel to drop. So then you got to start making modifications to keep that heel floating. Um, from a standpoint of what you can do without radiographs is simply go walk the horse in soft footing. See what happens to that foot. If that foot's sitting down and going forward, toes sinking and goes right to the next, then you're not overloading that check ligament system and that deep flexor tendon suspension system. If that horse goes to the if that horse goes to the dirt and his medial heel is the first thing that sinks into the ground, guess what? He's gonna start loading up that check ligament and lot, you know, lots of problems. Um, he's also probably beating up that inside heel considerably. So just watch what horses do, how they naturally, uh, what they naturally do in soft footing and what they move, and it'll give you a lot of uh, information about. Can you make, can you make your record? I uh, probably can. Do you think 
think that's an important consideration in their stall putting as well? Absolutely. Sometimes they're basically standing on the ground. Don't look too good on this end. So that the that that dynamic toe lever, I've got it measured at 76 before and 58 afterwards. And also considering, I think I think there's some things that we can't measure. I mean, I don't think we can measure again that like we're talking about. How does that thing operate in in soft footing? You know, what, what happens to that horse is where I think taking and watching your horses go, whether it's under saddle or just in the arena at, on lunge, is important to see how these things interact uh, in the soft footing. And what I expect from this shoe. Uh, is I want to see my sole depth start to improve. Taking leverage off the tendon decreases compression underneath the tip of the coffin bone because now we don't have that downward pull quite as much. So I'm going to start to see the sole depth improve. When I, if, if I were to shoot this horse again, uh, obviously I would be able to take x-rays and learn more about what, I'm, what, I, what I have done to the foot. If it was positive or negative. Did I have more heel crush? Did I have did my PA drop even further than it normally does? So it's not like this is what's going to be applied today and just like you do every day in your shooting practice is evaluate your response the next time you see the horse if what i would expect to see horse holds a good positive pa i'd like a report from the owner saying yeah he's still moving good that's so what we don't have any bad complaints right now so we don't want to get any bad complaints after we shoot the horse with this different approach uh so then we want to hear that uh, yeah knee action's good he's moving just as sound as he was uh, but i want to see i would like to see that sold up go from eight closer to 15. Uh, when a horse has, what we found venographically is that when you have a fully filled vascular network around the coffin bone is that it takes about 15 millimeters of sole depth to maintain that. That'd be five to six millimeters of hard protective horn and 10 millimeters of vascular supply. I think I've got an x-ray on here of a healthy venogram. Still, you can't see it very well and I can't really adjust that one. But anyway, you guys can come up and look at it later, but if you look, you kind of see the tip of the coffin bone there. There's 18 millimeters sole depth in that in that horse on the on the X-ray. So 10 to 11 millimeters of that is the vascular corium that is alive and, and is responsible for maintaining health of the tip of the coffin bone and health of the sole, uh, the growth that uh, that it creates. So if you have a horse that's got eight millimeters of sole, they almost always will hang on to that five to six millimeters of hard protective horn. So we can assume that if we've only got eight, then we've, we probably have our vascular aquarium is compressed to three millimeters. And that's why a lot of your thin sole horses will never grow sole, because everything is so compressed there that there's more load on it than there is unload. So your nutrient flow is going to be diminished. Any questions? Do these hind feet the same as the front? Uh, no. So hind limb management for negative PA uh, or for problems is a lot different. The hind feet are, they play to a total different tune. They're a lot different mechanically. They naturally want to load the back part of their foot anyway, so they typically don't require a whole lot of mechanics. Uh, simple, uh, simple leverage reduction and maintain a positive PA, I would never put, I, I say never, there are instances where I have put a full rocker trim on a hind foot for certain reasons, tendon lesions, tendon scarring, things that the other toes want to stay up in the air anyway, I would put something like that, but on most of any performance horses that I have, they're either barefoot with a kind of a, uh, I still think about when I'm trimming, when I'm trimming hind feet or bare feet, I'm still thinking about that mechanical pro, that mechanical thought process. And I've been able to maintain feet healthier better with leverage reduction trims, like a four point style trim, than what I would if I maintain a full perimeter of a toe. So most of the horses I trim that are barefoot behind, they, they, they're in a four point style trim where they're, they're kind of managing their own leverage, but hind feet are, have been super easy for me uh, and can respond a lot differently. Uh, there's some different techniques for using still a, a biplanar type trim where you're trimming more positive and you'll have at least a little bit of a heel kicker at the back. And then the next thing you know, that foot will be flat. That's a, that's a whole other lecture. I can show you some pictures of that later. What's that? Left 1230. I guess everybody don't mind skipping lunch, do they? We're essentially done except for finishing. So, the air gap 
you're talking about the air gap I was talking about earlier? Yeah, that, that's mainly to make sure I don't have sole pressure. Not necessarily on low pressure. Yeah. Just, just making sure, because what, what can happen with this approach that, that, that I've had people that I've uh, helped teach it um, is that they end up with a crown right there in the middle of the toe, and that's where the shoe's sitting on. So on a, a horse like this that has seven or eight millimeter sole is not going to like it. So the fire, you have to be careful. Uh, you don't have to be careful. It's, it's how you go about it. Yeah. You can make you can make yourself have a, a complication by not trimming that, and then and I and I prevent that complication by if you see when I trim that, my rasp was going perpendicular like this all the time. It was flat between this point and this point. If you take a if you take a curved surface and take a slice of it like that, you naturally create that gap right there. So when I when I've got a curved surface, I'm going to take a slice of it like that. Then there's there's a natural a natural unloading of that with an shoe, right? You end up touching here and here. That's about it. But if you don't, if you rasp this corner off, rasp this corner off, it ends up looking like that. You're trying to set a shoe on that, even that's even a flat shoe standpoint. You, you can't set a, a thin sole horse on its sole. We, we've all learned that. Is it part of the challenge of the fact that you're feeling like you can't off it, so you're kind of there's a element of difficulty in fitting it. I, I would you talk about using this style I, I would say there's definitely an element of complexity but anything that you haven't done before is definitely complex so I mean the first time that you start playing with something like this thought process I mean for goodness sakes think about the first time you tried to walk Something that's so simple that we all take for granted, but yet we dang near killed ourselves landing on the corner of a coffee table, you know. So, I mean, it, it's it, it, once you get experience with it, then it becomes more second nature and not problematic. And I, and I say the toe is one of the stoutest parts of the wall because it's also the thickest. It kind of acts like a, a car spring, I think. So as the foot loads. That thickness in the toe, that, that that full thickness in the toe, as the foot gets pushed apart, that's what helps bring it back together. So I get horses that, you know, we we, we pull the foot forward and we've aggressively dressed the front part of the foot to make that angle more steep, but yet we've we've decreased the wall thickness from seven and a half to eight millimeters down to three. We just diminished some of the structural integrity of the foot by making it appear more upright. And you only gain two or three millimeters of actual leverage reduction. So that, that amount of risk benefit ratio doesn't work well for me. When we can do a lot, be a lot more aggressive at reducing leverage and leave that hoof wall full thickness for the health of the foot. The horse is dependent upon a circular, round, healthy structure to support its whole weight. So if we're steady, if we keep thinning that away to make it look better aesthetically, then we at some point, we reach a point of decreasing marginal returns where now we have structural default. It's like, I, 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 I think about it like if my house was leaning, instead of fixing the house and try to prop it back up, I just went through with a sawzall and cut everything off and strip it. Well, that's what I look at a foot like, even though sometimes they may have a little flare or a dish or something like that. Yeah, I want to tidy it up so it looks better, but I won't get rid of all of it because that's the only structure that I have. Even though it's not pretty, it's all that horse has. So then I, I, will, I will try to improve the mechanical aspect so that he grows a better hoof capsule and not try to, on day one, make sure everything looks pretty yeah, by getting rid of excessive before. In, in fairness to you guys, it is 12.40 and we are going to start with Harry Stevens close to 1.30 as we possibly can. So you're more than welcome to hang out and watch Sammy finish up, but just let you know that we will start with Terry right at 1.30. Any other questions? What's that? What are you being used for? Oh, it's a job? Yeah. And pretty good one, really. I mean, for pleasure. For, uh, for as young as he is, in the, I've always felt like there's a, there should be some sort of combination of 
numbers that we could add up with like years of experience of the rider, age of rider, age of the horse and experience of the rider, that we could come up with this formulation to help horse owners that don't really know anything to stay away from some cases. This one would throw that loop off because this girl's seven years old, this is a three year old, and she's one, she's what? She's 11 now. Dang, time flies, duh. So she's 11, this horse is two, three now, and they just, they just hooked up and she's winning like crazy. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. This, this one would throw that calculation off considerably. Yes? Why did I rock the heel? So number one, it, the rock and the heel, think about sitting in a rocket chair and you pull the rocket chair behind you, you tilt forward. And a horse has got a kind of an underrun heel that wants to grow more forward than back, you could use that concept rocker that heel up to get further shoot back behind the support and not drop the angle. Where a lot of times we're worried about getting more and more heel mass, you let heel mass stack up on a foot like this and it's a pressure to run forward. So this concept allows for me to load the foot in its greater entirety and load the horn tubules where they're closer to where they're made and I, and I get the biomechanical advantages that we get from the roller motion and lever production at the same time. It, it depends on the degree of which you change. It depends on what lameness they have. So you have the potential of speeding a foot up with this. So then you're going to have more knee action, and they're going to, you know, they're going to be. All my lame horses, I see that they go from, especially in the Vigor case, they go from this to a lot bigger striding because now. This foot, when it comes up underneath it, I've already, he, he can start, his, his angle can start climbing. It'll stay on the ground longer, so that means this one can stay in the air longer. That's why I think a lot of the, the Vickler horses just want to do this, because they can't bring this one far enough underneath them to let this one go out front. So with this case, as he's coming back, the angles that were climbing, this one stays in the air. So my English horses, massage horses, they love this, because they're just, they can just really point. Some of my slower Western players type horses, if they're lame, and they have this little shuffle, and then all of a sudden they become more lame on one foot than the other. And then they get a head bob, and then you try to fix both feet, and they start striding out a little bit better. They don't like that because they like this little, you know, some of the older horses, the older style horses too, they just like that little shuffle that they get. So it can, it can speed one up.